Okay. Without I'm... further ado. Okay. Polarizing presentation. <laughs> okay, we're going to do that. I'm going to talk for a couple of minutes about how I got started in this and uh, and the three part blank, and then I'm going to do a demo of making the blanks for the boxes I make now. I, I've been fascinated with magnets since I was a little kid, you know. And, and when these rare earth magnets came along, I mean, they're just astonishing in, in their power. Um, here's some examples to play around with. See if you can you know, easily get those apart with your fingers and see what that feels like. Be careful you don't catch the web of your thumb in between them. <laughs> well, I mostly use, uh, I mostly use sizes like this. These are quarters. Uh, and three sixteenths and one eighths, and this is just a stack of a bunch of them. And the key thing to know about that, that, people get all sweaty about: is it a North Pole? Is it a South Pole? How do we tell? Well, we don't really care. What matters is they're going to stick together if the poles are opposite, and they're not going to stick together. And no matter what you do, if the poles are the same, and that's all you need to know. So there's a stack. They just the, these are the these are the kinds of magnets that I've been using in boxes for the last six or seven years when i got started making them I, I i they were all like this one is with the magnets exposed and i was okay with that in this where there's one magnet but when it got to be two or three or four magnets it became all about the magnets and you never saw the box so i started okay i put some veneer on them i glued veneer down and put the buried the magnets under under the veneers and i thought that was pretty crappy looking as well uh, but it was a, a try at concealing the magnets. And then I realized that I could make a three part blank. So I start out with a piece of wood and part it in two places. So I get three pieces. I got a top, I got a bottom, and I get a middle piece. Middle piece is the magnet block. So I carefully lay out and bore both sides and install the magnets in the magnet block then glue it all back together again and part the block in between the magnets and make the box. Uh, that will give you a really nice concealed magnet box like uh, this one. You'll be hard put. You can, you can see the glue lines in this once you start to look for it, but they're not obvious. Or like uh, this one, which is a pill box that I've a meds box or supplements that I've carried in my pocket for years. Uh, so the magnets in these are pretty well hidden inside the wood. And, and it's a really nice technique when it works. This one's like that too. The trouble with that technique is your blank preparation has to be perfect. If when you're trying, that means that all three layers of all, these are four surfaces. They have to be dead flat to fit. You go at them with a sanding board, uh, and you dub, you just approach it a little bit of an angle and you dub that corner off. Now you you, you probably have ruined the blank. Uh, you can glue them up badly. You'll get like this one. Um, the magnets, you can, the, I didn't properly flatten the blank. So I got a really bad glue line inside the box. The box is a loser. Catch. How much wood can you have? On top of the magnet before so it'll pull. The magnet from the magnet's point of view, wood and air are the same. So if it'll pull like that with air, it'll pull like that with wood. Yeah. The magnet does not care about wood. It just sees it the same as air. But what happens, of course, with the three-part blank is oh, you know, I'm parting in between here and I'm trying to make the two parts of the box that fit together and bloody hell, there's the magnets. And what I found when I was making these is I would get the beginning one and three would work out. And I later got to where I could get maybe two and three to work out. But there's like a couple of hours of prep in each blank. And often, you know, you can't make things like this with crappy wood. So you got to, you got to get, uh, you're using your good wood and you're going to blow a lot of it up. There's one with the, you can see what happens when the magnets get too close to the surface in that one. So I put magnets, as, and, and then what happens here, here's a blank that's glued up. And I wrote on it over here that they were one eighth inch magnets, uh, three sixteenths deep. And then I wrote over here that they were one eighth by one eighth. So I don't really know what's in here. <laughs> cut it, find out. Well, I can cut it and find out. I can get some detective work by laying little magnets on the surface and I can sort of 
confirm where they are and how they're going to work. But it's a it's a guess all the way. So bad note taking, bad sanding, bad gluing, uh, bad boring, all will lead to buggered up magnet boxes. Uh, so I put it aside for a few years. I can I couldn't see a way through that. I'm kind of happy with this one, by the way. This is the one I showed you before. It just won't go on wrong way. <laughs> Um, and that's because the magnets are one way in one way in this side and the other way over here, so it repels. And as I look at this, I probably made this oh, 2017, six years ago. I'm really uh, annoyed by how bad the turning is, but never mind. <laughs> so I put it aside for a while, and and then I I don't know. I was I made the thing for Doug. We, I started to glue little ears on the end of it with the magnets in it to try and make a box for sanding discs where that would still hold together with magnets. And that was an awful lot of work and a lot of prep and everything else like that. And it sort of then it hit me, wait a minute, I can put the magnets in this way. They don't have to be facing each other. They'll hold really well like that. Twist off, works good. Spins on, stays, in, stays on in your suitcase or whatever you're gonna do with it. Or in the case of boxes like this in your pocket, twist off spins back on. So suddenly with this, with the transverse magnet, I get, I get a couple of things I like. The magnet becomes decorative instead of in my face. So I'm okay with that. Um, if I want other decoration, I can inset some maybe ivory dots or something like that in the box. Um, and I'm going to be trying that soon because Angelo gave me a little bag of ivory chips that I have to figure out how to turn. So I'm pretty happy with that. So the other good thing about this is the, the the rate of blown up boxes is real low. They're they're pretty easy to make, and they don't. Uh, there's not too many places to screw it up, but there are some, and I'm going to show you where those places are in a little bit. Because what I discovered in all of this six years of fooling around with magnets and magnet boxes is preparation of the blank is everything. If the blank isn't right, the box is not going to come out right. Uh, and there's a bunch of small stuff in how that works. So uh, I know a lot of you guys are expert turners. And what I'm going to be showing you here tonight is, oh, yeah, yeah, we don't know all that. But I also know we have in the club on the screen, and maybe in the room, some guys who are not expert turners um, and maybe who have even never made boxes. So I'm going to show you um, preparation of the blank. Um, and I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going to get us up to where the blank is. I'm going to show you the stages that I go through in making, making a box like this. So without any more of that, I'm going to go to the lathe. Uh, let me see. So this is a, this is a, a block of cherry out of my basement. I've had it for a while. I probably bought it, bought it at one of the clubs. It's got some other guy's name on it. I didn't steal it. I bought it from him. Um, I'm going to make the, I'm going to make the tenon on this end. I'm going to put the tenon in the chuck. I'm going to turn the, turn the blank around and where I want to go with it is I want the tenon to be small enough so that when this is in the chuck, I can come right off the edge here without hitting the jaws. I want the tenon to be longer than a quarter of an inch and less than half an inch so it doesn't bottom out in the chuck. So the workpiece bears on the, the chuck bears on the workpiece, not on the bottom of the tenon. And I want this to be straight and square to the, it's parallel to the axis because later on when I go to bore the block box, I'm going to be putting it in a jig like this. And if this is not straight, and if this is not square, or if it's got a little lump, then I'm not going to get an accurate bore. So for all for those reasons, same as with the, the uh, three part blank, the blank has to be right. So I'm going to start. Is that okay? You guys okay with this up to here? Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. And I'm not familiar with this lathe, so um, I'm going to have a bit of problems here getting it going. Okay. I came in last week just to see if I could understand the lathe, and I think I did. And before I go any further, though, I'm going to make sure that this, because this thing doesn't even have a good, uh, I'm going to make sure this is tight in the chuck. And I did take some care to make sure this block was pretty square so that all four jaws are bare on the block. Okay, let's go. First thing I'm going to do is, is just do I'm going to 
go in for the tenon. I'm using a regular spindle gouge. I haven't got anything fancy about it. I'm really not familiar with this lathe, so I'm gonna have to just do a little bit of experimenting here. Okay. Yeah. I normally work on a robust lathe, so I'm always reaching for the stop bar, which is down here. I gotta get the bear, bear there. Yeah, good. That's in. And if I brought a spindle roughing gouge, I'd probably finish making this round with a spindle roughage gouge, but I didn't. So I'm gonna work with this, this guy. What I usually do is get the tool rest to be by eye parallel to the ways, the lathe ways, so that I can go A little more tenon than that. Now, what I'm also going to do is make this a little bit smoother and flatter. I'm going to use these are Boxmaster scrapers, negative rake scrapers, which I like a lot. I've got a few of them. Uh, this one is a straight one with a little wee bit of a curve in it. Um, I've taken the, the gospel according to the Boxmaster people and I sharpen them upside down while I'm using that platform there. So that this can sharpen this way. When I get a burr up here, I don't lose very much metal. The, the coarser the wheel, the rougher the burr. You can always take the burr off with a diamond stone. Uh, for hard materials like acrylic, you might want no burr. Um, for other materials, you might want to raise a burr with a cabinet maker's ticketer, so you get a little real fine little burr rather than the ragged burr that's off that wheel. But I'm going to use that right now, and I'm just going to tear this through. I got a little flat there, but I'm not going to worry about that. No, I am going to worry about it. I'm going to get rid of it. Flat there, don't want that. I'll probably get it off with this.
So there's my blank. The tenons are, uh, oh, just under three eighths. It's straight and it's parallel along this way. I want a little bit more, I want a little bit nicer shoulder down in there. So I'm just going to do that right quick. I'm going to part this. I'm going to leave the part that I'm going to make the lid. This is going to make one of those boxes like uh, the taller ones out there, not the big bottle, but the taller ones. So I'm going to part this. I'm going to give myself about, oh, an inch here. And I'm using a Sorby, uh, I don't know what you call them. It's about an eighth of an inch wide. And it's got a little cannel up here. So it's got little, two little sharp points there. And I always have to look at the label to know which way up to use it. Um, and I'm not going to draw a line because I know what I'm going to do. I just want to get about oh, around there. A little wider. Like them, that's parallel. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, they are, which is why I always make the circle about one and a half to which of the tool, but it's much narrower than a regular parting tool. So there's the bottom of the box. This will be the top of the box. So the first thing I'm going to do again is where this end off. Okay. Now I want to have enough room to actually shape the blocks a little bit. So I want the wall here to be around a quarter of an inch. I'm going to work by eye like I like to do. So but I'm going to set a caliper. And I want to use the same caliper to make the tenon that's going to fit in this. Okay, so there's my mark. Center dimple. And I always do this whether it makes any sense to other people or not. I'm going to bore in about that far. That's how deep I want the inside of the lid to be. So I'm going to put my little piece of tape on here. Show me how far that is. And I made a little dimple in there. This is just a bell hangers bit set in a, in a handle with, uh, this is happens to be Kevlar string in here because I had some. Um, I use this all the time. There you are. We got the bowl. Back to the turning tool. A little bit lower here now. Probably a little more further out. I know that in soft hardwoods like this, that each pass here, it's going to take about an eighth of an inch, maybe a little more. So I don't really need the center hole. Except without it, it's really easy to kid yourself and think you're at full depth and you're not. So that's roughed out. Now I get my box master tools. I actually made, they're double ended. And I actually mostly handhold them, but I did make handles for them with wedges. 
so I could hold it, turn the tool around and use it the other way around. But frankly, I'm going to ditch the handle. This one, it's quite square here. It's quite straight. Straight, straight. And this angle is just less than 90 degrees. I don't know what camera we're looking at. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I need that to be just less than 90 degrees because I want to go straight in here and I don't want the heel over here to dig a hole in the bottom of the box. Is there an upside or downside or a top or bottom to that? Absolutely, there is. This is the relief angle down below. This is the, I don't know how to, what to call these two angles. This top angle is ground at 25 degrees or so. This is ground at, I don't know, enough so that the angle between the top and the relief is less than 90, just under 90. The burr is up here on this side, on this top side, there. Same over here, the, this is the top. So this is the relief, this, this is the negative rake. This is the relief, the burr is on the top side. And in this case, I've relieved this side, so I have a squarish corner in here at the at the inside. Now I can't see in here, and the lighting sucks pretty bad. So this is what I usually do. One of these. Now I can see. How's that look on camera? <laughs> Huh? Like a geek is what it looks like. Looks like a geek, does it? Okay, that's what we want. Okay, now I want this so that the cutting edge is on center <coughs> when I'm when I've got it level. That's still a little low because I want to go straight in here and get this 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 wall to be straight in. That cutting edge is right on center. Lays is a lot different from my lays. I want it a little bit bigger. I've been practicing doing this with the uh, regular fiddle gouge, but I'm not good enough to show you that yet. So now I want to know if this is straight or sloped. And I can see by looking between the ruler and the latheways that I'm going in like this. So in other words, I'm further in here than I am out here. Another way to find that out uh, is the way that Richard Raffin teaches. You set a caliper, inside caliper, and you put it in here. At the bottom, it should just, just touch. And I can't drag it out. It tells me I'm bigger. I'm, I'm more wood out here than I got inside here. So I need to straighten that out, which I'm going to do by eye. I also want to square this edge off. I want to check it, check it again. By holding the ruler up. And that's pretty good. I can see that I have uh, the ruler is parallel to the lathe ways so of the ruler is bearing on the inside of the box in there. So I'm good with that. But since this is the lid, I got a little bit of wood here. I'm going to make it a little bit domed in there. It's the story of my life in the workshop that I pick stuff up and put it down and I don't know where the hell it is. I do it over and over and over again. Oh, this is this is the one I want. I already got it in the handle. I wasn't even recognizing it because it's in the handle. And I got a bad habit of covering the lathe with stuff.
I want to make a nice clean finished cut here. Home of my own lathe, I cranked this up to a couple thousand. Here I'm going at uh, 1100. What that changed up to 1300 though? Pardon? You want to go up, you want 3000 on your RPM? No, I'm fine with it. I'm fine with it. Yeah. I actually figure it doesn't actually matter how fast you go. Uh, although for little boxes, it seems to make, it seems to help to go real fast. I don't know why. So what I want in here is a flat at the very inside here. And then I want a little dome that's going to be inside the inside the box. And normally at home, I'd sand this right now, which I'm not going to do. But I do feel a, a lump there. I don't like that. So I'm going to go in and get rid of that. A lump right about there. How, how, how deep do you try and go for the overlap of those lids? So obviously it's a lot deeper than you would for a normal. Yeah, I want to I want to leave that half an inch. No. Uh, and, and the reason for that is I got a, I got this this piece like this, a little flat there, a little bit of a dome. We're near the tenon out here. And I'm going to have this mating piece is going to go in there like this. It's going to be the same height. I want to bore the hole for the magnets right in the middle. If I air just a little bit on that, I'm going to get either too close up here and it's going to be too fragile, or I'm going to get too close here and it's going to be too fragile. So it's going to be in the middle. And in the middle, uh, of a half an inch with a 3 16 magnet, I got enough wood either way. Uh, now, because I'm talking, I think I probably screwed this up. Yeah, I did. It's now tapered back inside. I think I'm going to sharpen this. The reason I'm having to do it multiple times is this ain't quite the same angle as I use at home. The CBN wheel, this uh, white wheel is not very straight or clean either. So this edge is not real good right now. I was afraid I would have trouble doing this here on this lathe. That's not bad. Now, actually, in the real world, I'd fool around in here a bunch more, but I'm going to go move on from here. <clears throat> Always a second way to try. Yeah, I know. It's like the damn discs. So there's that. Lay doesn't have a positive uh, spindle lock. I don't quite know how that works. Oh, I see. I do yeah, that. Exactly. Now I got it. Okay. I want that tight. Yeah, but the controls aren't where I expect them. <laughs> <laughs> I go reaching for them and they're just not there. Okay, my first step is I want to again make this make this uh, straight across, which it is almost. Move that little nub in there. Thank you. 
Okay. Without changing the caliper setting, try and get the same mark. At this time, I want to make the any that goes in uh, the, the, the male part that goes into here. And I know I want it to be the same depth as this is, which is just under 5 eighths. So I'm going to make a line on here at just under 5 eighths. I'm probably in the wrong place, but it's close enough for getting started here. And since this is an end grain blank, I often work with cross grain as well as end grain. But this one's is an end grain blank. I'm going to start by just making a nick in there so I know where that line is. And remove the material. Now, what I'm really after here is a taper that ends where my mark is. That's pretty close to it, I think. Yeah. I went too far because that's where this fits, is there. Uh, that doesn't matter for these purposes. Shoulder there. And at this point, I want a snug fit, which I almost have. Now, if I got it too too look cracked up, and I want to remove some material, I can do that. I can go further into this block, but I don't, I'm not going to need to do it. I'm just going to relieve this another shaving. I'm looking at it by eye and hoping that it's pretty straight. It isn't. I can see it by looking at the lathe ways. So I'm going to paddle it with this thing a bit. What I don't want to do right now is sand it. If I sand it, it won't be round. Okay, that's a little looser than I like it, but it'll work for these purposes. Now, the thing I failed to do that I mean always to do is to make a witness mark on these things before I cut them apart so I can get the grain back the way it grew. And I can spot it here. And I'm going to line it up pretty good. And I'm going to just use my ruler. What I usually do is take choose the number one jaw and draw there. On a straight line here, and I'll make a triangle. And now I can get that back together the way it was. And since this is a little looser than I like for boring, I'm going to put a little bit of blue tape on it. A little piece there. Okay. 
piece around the halfway around. What I wanted to do was cut that tape off so it's not going to ever interfere. And then I can make this. Okay, so that's good. So I'm going to confirm that this is the right length. It is. Now I've got to get a line around here that's halfway. So this was almost 5 8, so I'm going to be at almost 5 16. Now if I had a a tailstock, uh, what do you call them, a live center with a wooden plug on it so I can uh, bring that up the bear on here, I would do that. I can't do the full uh, thing that I want to do next. So I want to, first I want to put this line on it. Just do it that way. And the next thing I have to do is divide this into three. I think there's an index hit in, head in here. And I think it has 24 holes, but I don't know that for sure. So at my house, I would use my index head and my tail stop, my tool rest to draw my three 120 degree lines. Uh, and having done that, I would tape the blank together on the outside. I would end up with a blank like this. This has the, the line around it. I marked the center holes and the center holes and the back of the drill press. There's a center line here. So I can set this up in, in line with the column and get the drill bit exactly where I want it. Clamp this to the table, clamp this to the jig so that the whole thing is clamped. And I'm gonna go down in one push because I found that when I go in and out and in and out, I get a hole that is enlarged. Mm -hmm. If I want a hole that is not enlarged, I'm going to go into the depth of the wall plus the, the wall to come on the inside part and bore the three holes. So I'll be boring there and there and there. And when I've done that, I end up with a blank like this. Bore, 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 three bores, and it's a tight fit. Now I can make the lid and uh, I, the lid and the box body to from these parts. What can go wrong at this stage? Look good, don't it? Three bores. Draw all in here. They didn't go into here. I drew the witness layout lines on this part instead of on this part. <laughs> so that can go wrong. Uh, this one, I turned away the material here and then bored the holes. And you know, it just didn't it just didn't all fit together nice and tight and loose. And so this hole is almost busting through here. I can't save that. This one's a little better and this one's a little better. So I got the holes in three different places. Pretty sure I handheld it. Uh, that's pretty much what happens when you handhold it. You get holes that are, that are not in the right place. You get holes that are just a little bit oversized and the box doesn't work. So let's see what I got here. So I'm not gonna go through the turning of the box, the shaping of the box, because that's so much a matter of personal taste. You're gonna shape the box any way you want. But here are three that I made the other day, and I guess I'll just work right here. So this one is, I think, Coco Bolo. It's it's heavier, and I like them right now. Uh, after making the box, or as part of making the box, I always relieve either this part or this part. Uh, I want the box snug for boring, so that the holes are aligned and and and, and they stay lined up. I don't want after boring the holes to screw around with this shoulder or this one because I want that to stay. If I if I redo relieve that shoulder now, the holes aren't going to line up and the lid is going to be floating out here someplace, which it'll do just fine. But I like them to sit down tight. Uh, this is cross grain. This wood is going to move. So if I make this leave this so it's a nice snug wood turner fit, it's going to bind. It's not going to it's not going to actually work. 
the snug wood turner fit that everybody loves is uh antithet it is, is works at cross purposes with the magnets the magnets will grab it and hold it nice um if you try and stay wood turner snug then you're you're doing this and fighting with them and you don't know where it's sticking is it the box sticking is the magnet grabbing what's going on so this this fit actually wants to be loose and it wants to be loose by however much is appropriate for your wood and your size of box and and what kind of movement you can expect and you only find that out with time um, so this is a cross grain box this is an end grain box i think this is called marble wood i'm not sure it's something i got at groff and groff after i sanded this yesterday i could barely breathe i did not turn on my dust machine and it's an and the dust got in me so i'm not going to be turning this wood again but this is maybe a nice looking little box john just to your point about the wood turner's fit there when you've got those magnets on it, it behaves like a wood turner's fit because the magnets are pulling in opposite directions so it's actually keeping it centered is it not no they, it, you'd like it to do that but it won't it'll grab one way it'll stick one way or the other oh, okay. it, it'll find you you can see if you play with these they they all have a they all have a fit this is a this is an end grain one it does only very little bit of motion so it, it it works pretty good but i can tell that it this the one magnet over here is the one that's that's closest this is just a little tight um, and what i can do i never make i want the magnets when i install the magnets i want them flush here recessed a bit here i don't care what happens in here so i've got a little 30 second in here i can go in here and relieve this a little bit more if i can chuck it again and i can i I'll just grab this in my chuck, center it in there. Uh, if I'm worried about dinging the wood up, I'll wrap it with two or three wraps of electrical tape. Um, and that'll protect the wood while I grab it in the chuck. And then I can go in there and I can just take another cut in there and make enough room so that this will not bind the way it is doing right now. Um, this one here is, a, this is, this is, this is the kind of loose looseness of fit that I want. It has a, it's a, it's a it has about, I don't know, not a 16th, probably a 32nd of play, but enough play so the wood movement is not going to bind up in this box. That's that's the goal I'm looking for. Um, if you make these, it doesn't matter. This has got the magnets are in the middle of this one. It's a two sided box with centered magnets. So that eliminates the. You still want a loose fit though. It wants to spin free. It does not want to get all bound up with wood, with tight, with tight wood or a real slick wood turner fit. So the next next thing I'm going to do, and the last thing I'm going to do, is um, install magnets in one of these. This is a lot like where I was going with this. So I'm going to do it in this one. I think I am, yeah. This one has got some wee cracks in this wood. This is pear wood that I dried myself. So probably I ought to finish this with CA glue in the end which I have never tried before, but I probably will try it with this one. Anyway, I'm gonna show you what I do to install the magnets. Um, first of all, I wanna know how thick that is. Dial caliper, plastic dial caliper. And I learned that this is just over an eighth and then under three sixteenths. And I actually have magnets that are Oh, five thirty seconds and a tenth, and you know they've got a lot of sizes, and I've got them all. And over here, it's three sixteenths, which is what I want. So I can put a three sixteenth magnet in here and an eighth magnet in here. And here's a three. These are three. These are eight magnets, and these are three sixteenths magnets. You're talking about length, not diameter. I'm talking about length, not diameter. Exactly. So what I want is. I want three of one kind and three of the other. Wait a minute. What have I got here? So this is the three sixteenth part. The thing I got to do to get to not the magnets want to attract. So what I got to do is not rotate this. I got to I, since they're all sticking together now, they're going to continue to stick together if I never rotate it. So I'm going to put one magnet in there, one in there. And this is why I don't want the hole to be big. I want them to stay there. And one in there. 
And I'm going to, without rotating the thing again, I'm going to put one in there. One in there. And the last one in there. Now I usually do this with a long stack of magnets as a tool here, there. Okay. I do not want them protruding where they're gonna, where they mate. I want them recessed a little bit. Um, several reasons for that. One is I may need to adjust the fit of this box, but the other is that when they scrape together, they scrape. They're hard, they're very stiff, they're very brittle, and they will, when banging around, they'll chip. Uh, and I don't want that. So, and I don't want, and also they're strongest, of course, when they stick together metal to metal. I don't want that either. Um, I want a little bit of an air gap so that they will stay, uh, so they don't grab metal to metal. I really like them to be snug, splush on the outside. So I'll, I'll spend a bit of time fussing around with this to get them the way I want them. That's looking pretty good. Here they gotta go, this one has to go in a bit, too, stick it out too far. And I just, just for the sake of showing the demo, I have a, have a bamboo pusher. I can just tighten its hole, I can jam it with this and, and get it the way, where I want it. So I want it just below the surface here, just below the surface there just below the surface there, which I'm just going to get with my thumbnail. And again, I'll fuss with this until it feels right. I'm okay with them being protruding inside the box a little bit. I don't mind that, but I don't want them sticking out on the outside. And of course, I can't test this. If I put this together, then the magnets will pull themselves together out of the holes. They'll jam. It'll lock like it was a kid's ball, a kid's toy bank, you know, one wooden, uh, you know, get a magnet halfway between and you'll never get it apart. So I'm, I cannot test them. So I get them where I want them. I open up. I'm just using El Cheapo super glue here. And I did not bring accelerator. So we're just going to sit, glue these and let them sit. I just want the tiniest bit of glue in there. That magnet just fell out, and in there, and that fell out. And that's a problem because now I don't know which way around it goes. So I'm going to move a bit of glue there, a little bit of glue there. And since I'm going to finish these, I don't care about uh, a bit of a little bit of glue on the wood. It'll all disappear under the finish. That is sticking out, and that's got to go in there. Okay. Now this one, this is a problem. Get some more of them, so I get something to work with here. Stack of magnets. I have to figure out which way around is the right way around. That's it, right there. That sticks. So if it sticks here, and I've still got it the same way around, and I'm going in this from the outside like I did before, then it's going to be fine. So there it is. I want to get some glue on that right now. I'll leave that there to sit there and dry. That's as far as I was going to go. Questions, comments? Thank you. Put you all to sleep. <laughs> Perfect. That's what I was shooting for. So you can get a demo prize, right? Yeah. <laughs> you all numbers for it? Yeah, right. Uh, no, we have, we don't, I've usually done that here. So um, there's these, these are not going to go as a demo prize. No. Um, probably a good idea, though. We probably ought to, you know, or maybe we could have a, a post demo auction. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Get some money and more money in the tool fund. Um, these are going to dry and this glue is going to run. And at home, I'd use, a, I'd go in with a little accelerator and a paper towel and diddle around um, a bunch more. Um, but I'm going to count on being able to cope with this amount of runoff here in the finishing. I actually don't usually finish this way. What I usually do, uh, and I didn't for the demo, but what I usually do is finish as I go. So when I have a surface on the lathe 
that I like. I'll finish that right there. I'll sand it, spray it with a uh, spray lacquer, one sh a, hit, a light hit of spray lacquer. Let it sit there for a minute while I slowly roll the lathe around so keep the lacquer moving and then turn the lathe on and buff that off with a paper towel or rather a, a no lint uh, shop rag. That puts a very infinitesimal coat of lacquer on the wood, which I want. It'll bring up the color of the wood and it'll harden the surface fibers and then I can wax it, which is what I end up doing most of the time. Um, and I find it best with all of these small dipsy things really to finish it, make a surface while it's still on the lathe, finish it. Make the next surface while it's still on the lathe, finish it. Uh, and then when I get when I finally get it off the lathe at the end, it, it's almost entirely finished. There's always some area that needs a little bit of extra work, but not much. Does that help, John, with with uh, super glue stains running out? The lacquer basically will, will conceal them completely. See if you have the lacquer on there. Yeah, you won't see them. You won't see it. You're going to see it in this one because it's not lacquer. But I think I bet I can bury them. I'll probably finish this with uh, spray uh, poly, and I think poly will cover that pretty, pretty, pretty well. Uh, I don't. I think there are solvents for super glue, but I don't know. I've just never. I, usually, that's when it's finished. It, when I'm when I'm working with a pre-finished box, you just generally don't see it at all. Any other questions? Questions out there in the Zoom land? They're all out cold. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. It's not a question. It's an observation, and I made this point on uh, one of the coffee hours. Do not use. Do not make a magnet box to hold hearing aid batteries. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very discovered that magnets will drain hearing aid batteries yeah. in like one day. Just yeah. being near them. And you get some place where you need them, and you take them out and put them in, and they are absolutely dead. I'll, I'll tell you the other thing that happens with magnet boxes. You're carrying one of these little boxes in your pocket with your supplements or your Tic Tacs in it, and you got a paper clip in your pocket, and you pull the box out of your pocket, you're going to have the paper clip with it. And if you put it, I've seen my wife do this. She puts it in her handbag and pulls it out, and her keys are hanging on. <laughs> they will grab anything ferrous. That's just what. That's one of the what happens with magnets. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.